Well, this morning, we want to read a couple of texts, and uh, it's also Scout Sunday, February 7th, and um, we have a couple of our scouts. Harry and Max are going to come up and do one of the readings for us this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So come on up, guys, and uh, they're going to split reading this famous text for us. Go ahead. Well, let me get your microphone. Hold on a second. Middle one, Ed. I'll hold it for you, all right? If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient, love is kind. It isn't jealous, it doesn't brag, it isn't arrogant, it isn't rude, it doesn't seek its own advantage, it isn't irritable, it doesn't keep a record of complaints, it isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Outstanding. Thank you, guys. Well done. I'm always impressed, impressed at how well these guys read the scriptures. It's fantastic. We need to put them in the lay reader rotation for sure. They're, they really do a good job. Well, Paul talks about love and um, talks about that famous uh, passage that we often use at weddings. And uh, I want to read a passage then that is less familiar from a book that's less familiar to most of us. You don't often hear it read in church, but it's from Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Listen, it's my lover. Here he comes now, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Here he stands now outside our wall, peering through the windows, peeking through the lattices. My lover spoke and said to me, Rise up, my dearest and fairest, my fairest, and go. Here the winter is past, the rains have come and gone. Blossoms have appeared in the land, the season of singing has arrived, and the sound of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The green fruit is on the fig tree, and the grapevines in bloom are fragrant. Rise up, my dearest, my fairest, and go. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we are so grateful to be in your presence today, and we ask that as we hear this word, it would speak to us powerfully. In the name of Christ, amen. You know, uh, one of the things that we like to do as a family every once in a while is go to browse at the bookstore. There are still bookstores. I saw recently in the Wall Street Journal that Amazon is actually putting in... Uh, brick-and-mortar bookstores so people can look at books before they order them online, which is bizarre on many levels. But, but there's something great about going and browsing at the bookstore. And at Barnes & Noble, you will notice that there is a section in Barnes & Noble on love and sex. I discovered this, and if you look at the titles there, there's all kinds of titles about how to do sex. There's stuff on the Kama Sutra, there is uh, Mars and Venus in the bedroom. There's all these different titles, most of which is about how to put what where, apparently. Positions, all those kinds of things. There's even sex for dummies, uh, just in case you know nothing whatsoever about that. It's about a how-to section. And uh, 
I look at that section, but I don't pull any books off the shelves because I'm always afraid that someone will come from my church and say, what's going on here? So, uh, so I just look at the section and say it's okay. Uh, the sex section, say that three times fast, it will blow your mind. But, um, but there's all kinds of books out there that will tell us about sex, how to have great sex, but I want to argue this morning there's only one book that we really need. It's the book that we've been using throughout this series, which we wind up today. And remember where we've been. We start at the very beginning, where God references sexuality in the very beginning, creates humans in his own image, creates them for relationship and connection and community with one another. We le learn about what happens when sex is taken out of that context of two become one flesh and how it becomes distorted. We talked about the mission of marriage, that, that it's about our mission. It's part of the kingdom of God, about living this life and reflecting the kingdom in our families and our relationships, whether we are married or single. We talked about sexual identity and how that's an inadequate marker for identifying who we are, that our real identity is found in our relationship with Christ. And then last week, we talked about the example of Jesus. We talked about how he was able to engage people a wide variety of people with intimacy and love and care. Well, today we want to get to some of the good stuff. As one of the guys said to me after one of my sermons, he said, when are you going to tell us how to? How to? When are you going to give us homework for a sex series? Well, here it is today, and for that we turn to the book. Now, Song of Solomon is a book that is really sort of this passionate, unbridled view of sexuality. It's unusual to find something like that in the Bible, because when you think about the Bible, you don't generally think about excitement and sexuality. But there it is. I remember when I was in middle school, and I was sitting in a sermon, bored in the sermon, much like you are today, and, and, uh, and I'm flipping through the Bible because... That's what you do when you're in the Presbyterian church growing up. You flip through the Bible. And I came across Song of Solomon. And I began to read things like, Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns of a gazelle. And I thought, this is quite interesting. I did not know this was in here. Um, in fact, it sits right in the middle of the Bible, kind of like a centerfold, if you think about it. And it's one of those, one of those kinds of books. But when we look at it, scholars don't know what to do with it. I mean, a lot of people wonder why this is in the biblical canon at all in the first place. It's a book that never mentions God, only tangentially. It's a book that has this passionate love poem going back and forth between this young man and a young woman. She calls him a stag, a young stag bounding across the hills as we read earlier. One of the guys earlier asked his wife during the sermon, he said, well, am I a, a stag? She went, no. So, so that's, you know, you always have to take it with a grain of salt. These are young people, but they're, they're excited about being with one another. This is unusual for it to be in the Bible. So unusual that people have come up with metaphors about it. One of the ancient Jewish traditions is that this is actually a reflection, a metaphor for the relationship between God and Israel. And later on, Christians picked it up as a metaphor for the relationship between Christ and his church. I don't know what the origins of it are, but I do know that it's this lusty, luscious poem about real unbridled sexuality, but within the context of a committed marriage relationship, or at least moving in that direction. So this morning I want to use this as kind of a model for us to think about how to, how to have a great sexual relationship. So if you're married this morning, pick up your ears, especially guys. Uh, this is going to be a lot for you this morning because I accessed this as a guy. Uh, Harry and Max read earlier, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Men tend to do that, so we tend to think about sexuality in this way. If you're single or you're thinking about getting married someday, this could be notes you want to take down for stuff that has been learned over a lifetime of wisdom and, and from reading the scriptures. If you're single and wanting to know more, if you're a grandparent, if you're counseling those grandchildren, wanting to help them have a healthy sexual relationship, a healthy life, a healthy marriage, these are things you might want to write down. They're very simple to remember. 
I usually don't do three-point sermons. Uh, Chuck Killian, who was one of my professors at Asbury, said that our sermons should always be pointless. And I have striven for that throughout my entire career. But today I'm going to give you three points, three C's that will help you remember. Alliteration is always good. So the three C's are these. Commitment, communication, and cooperation. We begin with commitment, which is really the ground of any good marriage, any good relationship. When we read Song of Solomon, we see that this young couple are very committed to one another. When you look at verse 16, for example, in chapter 2, it says this, I belong to my lover and he belongs to me. There's a sense of deep commitment in this couple, even though when you read through the entire book, they've never yet consummated their relationship. They begin with commitment. And that's so radically different than the way that our culture talks about sexuality. We think sex is recreational. It's something we should do. It doesn't matter if it's committed. It's just something that we do with our bodies. But as we've learned throughout this series, that commitment is a reflection of the kind of commitment that God has toward us. The covenant of marriage is reflective of the covenant that God had with Israel, that Christ has with the church. In that sense, Song of Solomon really does give us a ground for what that means. These two lovers are sort of approaching and moving away from one another, but it's all about anticipation. That's not something we look forward to in our culture. We are after instant gratification. We want it all and we want it now. Our young people are taught over and over again through messages that this is what it's supposed to be about, to reach the Holy Grail, to get there as soon as possible. The commitment might come later. But we know, looking over and over again statistically, that when we start with sex and then go toward commitment, commitment rarely sticks. When we start with commitment, when we start by intertwining our brains and our spirits before we intertwine our bodies, then we lay the groundwork for a relationship that is healthy and long-lasting and sexually fulfilling. You know, it's interesting, this afternoon uh, we will watch uh, the Super Bowl, and many of you will watch it for the commercials, right? Because the commercials are great. And uh, they realize this, and so now they're starting to publish a lot of these commercials in advance. I was watching a bunch of them yesterday. And in these commercials, single people look like they are having a blast. Every beer commercial is the beach and people, you know, on the beach, and they're just, they're just so sexy and so happy and just can't wait, you know, to be together and all of that. But you know what the surveys tell us? Over and over again, they tell us that married couples, in fact, long-time married couples, have the best sex lives. That is not disputable. Why is it? It's because commitment precedes sex. It's put in its proper context. When you wait for marriage, when you have sex after commitment, it's sex that is able to be sustaining and useful and enjoyable for a lifetime. Commitment is absolutely key. Remember what it says in Genesis 2, they shall leave father and mother and cleave together and become one flesh. That's the goal reflective of our intimacy with God. So we begin with commitment. The second C is communication. And I can't stress this wasn't one enough because when couples come to me for counseling, that's often the, the issue, the presenting issue is communication, that they are not communicating well with one another. They're talking past one another. And I fa in fact, I think that, that our culture teaches us to do it that way. I mean, think about it. We we communicate in burst transmissions these days, right? 140 characters on Twitter, a Facebook post, an email, a text message. But, you know, even text messaging is getting to be kind of too much. Now we have emojis, right? You have those little smiley faces that can convey the kissy face or the sad face or the happy face or the winky face, as I call it, you know, you can kind of get the sense of it. Now we don't even text words to one another. We text emojis to one another. Pretty soon our culture's dialogue is going to be a bunch of monosyllabic grunts. Uh, eh, eh, you know, that kind of thing. 
That's what it's going to be about. We've lost the art of deep communication. Our families are stressed. We are running in a hundred different directions all the time. Jennifer and I were talking about this last night as, uh, as we were in the kitchen and, and realizing that a lot of our communication is like a meeting, you know, where we're planning schedules, we're doing some strategic planning, we have the finance committee report, you know, we have all those things that are happening as part of this, this relationship. And that there's rarely time for us to actually have really good communication with one another. I think it's something we have to recapture. And I think the church should be leading in this area. One of the things I think that we have to recapture, and I've become more and more convicted of this recently, is the discipline of writing notes, handwritten notes. I mean, when was the last time you got an actual love letter from your significant other? I mean, handwritten out on paper. We were talking about this. It's been a long time. You know, when I was in the Army, in the days before email and text messaging and things like that, those letters were a lifeline. I mean, I think about, amen, that's exactly right. Mail call, best part of the day. Even today, my wife will tell you, I'm the one who gets the mail. I'm obsessed with getting the mail. It's my deal. Because I remember those days. I remember writing out love notes on the back of an MRE box in the field and sending it off and then waiting for the reply and once you get the letter back you read it over and over again and you you smell it and you think oh you know she spent time to write and look at how she formed the letters and and you parse it more than you do scripture you know you think about it over and over again I carried it in the breast pocket of my BDUs so that so I could pull them out and read them when I had a spare moment but we've lost the art of doing that I want to suggest that that's something we might want to recapture it's to slow down our communication and to express our deep love to one another. To express the emotion. You may not be a poet. You may not be a super duper writer. But the very fact that you've taken the time to do it communicates deep love to the other. The other thing that we, we do is, is we like to take walks together. In the summer, a lot of times we will leave the house and walk down to Bear Creek Elementary School and we will simply walk around the track. That's our time for a connection. We do it less in the winter, but we do talk in the car on the way to the Y where we're on separate treadmills walking away anyway. But, but, uh, but we do try to make that time to kind of talk about our hopes and fears, our desires, our long-term plans, all those kinds of things. Do you have time built into your relationship for real face-to-face -face communication. Without that, we are simply talking past one another. The book of Song of Solomon reveals this. This is a dialogue between this man and this woman with the daughters of Jerusalem thrown in every, while, every once in a while as a Greek chorus type of thing, sort of commenting on the relationship. I wonder what would happen if we recaptured that sort of back and forth together and how much that would deepen our relationships and in turn then deepen our life physically with one another as well. So commitment and communication. And then the third one is cooperation. Now, Song of Solomon gives us this sort of pre-marriage look because they never really consummate the relationship. They're anticipating it. They're looking forward to it. But once you get in the marriage relationship, you know that it is a give and take. Harry and Max read for us from 1 Corinthians 13, which is not a wedding text, even though it's often read at weddings, but it's all about love as service to the other. Cooperation, then, is critical in a marriage relationship. One does not just serve the other. Each serves the other. I was uh, in a church my first church as a uh, youth pastor. And Dave McCullough was a senior pastor. Dave is still one of my mentors. And Dave published a sermon title on the marquee out on the highway, which the title of the sermon was Sex Begins in the Kitchen. And this was the late 80s. He got letters. Oh my, did he get letters. But the point of the sermon was that if you really want to have a good sexual relationship, it begins in the mundane tasks of life. 
it begins in the day-to-day. So, for example, guys, I'm going to give you a sex tip today. This is for the guys right here. Um, I hope you'll listen carefully. You're not going to find this in GQ. You will not find it in Men's Health. You will not find it even in Playboy. Here it is. You ready? You want to have great sex? Do the dishes. Do the dishes. Um, my wife would tell you that my sexiest feature is my dishpan hands because that's, and I never used to do that. I never used to do that because I, I didn't, didn't think about it. But serving one another is a way of communicating that deep love and affection that says, I'm in this with you. I'm cooperating with you so that together we can do the things that that we need to do so that we can spend more time and enjoy one another and enjoy our children even better. I was talking to a friend of mine who said that uh, he was talking to somebody in his church and and the woman said confidentially in a counseling session, she said, said, you know, the the sound that makes me the most aroused is when my husband is using the vacuum cleaner. That's what she said. (laughs) Or as Time Magazine puts it, you know, you have to help your wife crossed the things off her to-do list, otherwise you are just one more thing to do on that list. It's important for us to cooperate and share with one another. The older I've gotten, the longer we've been married, the more important I see that being. Commitment, communication, cooperation. Those are three keys to great sex. It has nothing to do with what goes where, has everything to do with how you intertwine your relationship together. Yesterday, I was uh, part of a funeral for a man who had been married for 60 years. John Eck, uh, many of you know Ruth, uh, who's a member of our church. Her husband passed away this past week. And uh, they would have been married 60 years in April. And when you look at couples who've been married that long, they understand this more than anyone else. In fact, the more that they live into it, the more each other begins to be shaped by it. I love how theologian Helmut Thielicke puts it in his book, How the World Began. He tells this story. He says, I once knew a very old married couple who radiated a tremendous happiness. The wife especially, who was almost unable to move because of old age and illness, and in whose kind old face the joys and sufferings of many years had etched a hundred lines, was filled with such a gratitude for life but I was touched to the heart. Involuntarily, I asked myself, what could possibly be the source of this kindly person's radiance? In every other respect, they were common people, and their room indicated only the most modest comfort. But suddenly I knew where it all came from, for I saw those two speaking to each other, and their eyes hanging upon each other. All at once it became clear to me that this woman was dearly loved. It was not because she was a cheerful and pleasant person that she was loved by her husband all those years. It was the other way around. Because she was so loved, she became the person I saw before me. You know, as Christians, we believe that God's love shapes us into the people he wants us to be. I think that's true for our relationships as well. The more we love the more we shape the other person. The more we are loved, the more we are shaped. I think that's how God designed it. And the more we work on it, the more we live into that design, the more that we understand that love is patient and kind and serving, the better our marriage is, and by extension, the better our sex lives will become. Commitment, communication, cooperation. Make sure that you always read the right book. Let's pray.